On today's show, we're talking about how you build a plan to actually grow next year with all the uncertainty in the world. We're going to talk to you about budget, strategy, and the mistakes everybody makes. You're going to want to stick around. It is going to be the show that sets you up for success over the next year. I'm your co-host, Kip Bodner, Chief Marketing Officer at HubSpot. I'm joined by my co-host, Kieran Flanagan, who's the Chief Marketing Officer at Zapier. This is Marketing Against the Grain, your show for marketing-minded people everywhere. All right, we Dublin. Kieran, we're doing a show that is based on real life because we were walking up to the studio to record today, and you were talking about planning stuff that you're doing in Zapier. I was talking so about planning. planning stuff, and we were like, hey, you know what? Maybe we should do a show. And like pull back the curtain and talk about planning and talking talk about how you build a real strategy for a year and how you actually execute and grow a business. You and I have done this a lot. Right. Like we're 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 not amateurs. We I would, I would go so far to say we are professionals at building strategies and grinding out and executing those strategies. And so we want to share how the hell we're actually going to do that today. Can I say one thing? Yes. Yeah. I want to make sure our YouTube audience, because they're, th they're thinking about this right now. Please. Yes, I'm wearing the same jumper for two consecutive episodes because we were recording this back to back. I'm uh, usually styling on my YouTube, but I just want to make sure. Like, oh, <laughs> I love that he's so vain. By the way, by the way, uh, YouTube audience, can we have a vote of whose whose shirt's better? Oh my, come on! People love the stripy. The Are pattern you serious? Jumpers. I am I do rocking. Like the velvet. I do I'm like rocking the velvet. A, a burgundy and blue velvet like polo. Like, come on. This got, is, got some, uh, this got is some a, suede. This is the, so, yeah, there's the, oh, there's a little nylon on the side. So good this you is... have to wear it for two episodes. <laughs> exactly. Two episodes, <laughs> but hey, this is the, this is the price grinding. of, this is grinding. Well, this is the price of also recording live in IRL because we know that we've gotten some feedback that people love it when we do the show together. Right. I was in Dublin, so we were able to find some time to get together and I'm talk about salty. it. I'm still salty. The reason I bring up the jumper is, I, and just so like Darren can like, log this that we need to do a new shoot. I'm still salty about the jumper they used for our promotional material. People go look at the thumbnail on the YouTube channel. I look like an old Macaulay Culkin. Like, I'm you're in the, the exact same I mean, jumper. don't you just look Macaulay like an old Culkin. Macaulay Culkin? No, like, I'm using the same. Go and look at that picture. I'm I'm wearing the same jumper as Macaulay Culkin, Home Alone, original, and I'm doing this with my face, right? You I, actually do look kind of like Macaulay behind Culkin. Behind the scenes, just so everyone knows, I went and did a photo shoot. They asked me to go do a photo shoot. I brought four cool jumpers and that one was the one I was wearing. And they said, let's do some test shots. I did 500 photos that day and they used the test, one of the, the test, test shots, shots before I even got my cool jumper, <laughs> cool jumper on. So that's that's what happened there. So there you go. Somebody really likes sweaters. I do he like sweaters. He likes them call, to call them jumpers, which is also weird, but it's fine. It's fine. Uh, look, it's a good sweater. I think it's so good people can take it for two episodes, but I, we appreciate the disclaimer. But what people are really going to know is how we actually grow next year. If you're in a business out there or if you're an entrepreneur, you're thinking about your your plan next year, you're like, this is the period of time, October, November, where you're like, all right, I got to build a plan. I got to actually, I ha I'm accountable to myself or my board members or my venture capitalists or who have you about a plan of, of growing this business. And how do you actually do it is the question of today's show. And I think, any great plan starts with a strategy. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how we build strategy. And then I'm going to talk to you about the secret element of a great plan that I haven't even talked to you about, Carrot. It's something we do, but we've never talked about and branded. So it's gonna, I think it's going to be really good. So break down for everybody. You're, you're in planning session. Like, how do you get the strategy right? This is a good debate to have, right? <laughs> so I try, to, I try to distill it down into something really simplistic. What I look at, at the moment for next year. And I think I've gone through different phases based yeah. upon, am I looking like three years ahead or am I looking well, so, a year So I think ahead? that's an important, first important point when you're defining a strategy, it's what is the time period? Is right. it a quarter? Is it a year? Is it three years? Right. Or is it more? For the point of this show, we'll talk about a one-year strategy. That's going to be the most common. People are going to kind of look at a 12-month strategy. Yeah, right? but I'm, I'm going to, so first of all, I am going to do like a 24-month vision for the group yeah. that I manage, which is like marketing and growth. And then also kind of like the self-serve business, which I, I kind of do the GM-ish role for the self-serve business. So I want to have like a vision. I want of, an ish role, by the way. GM -ish. A GM-ish role. If, I want an ish role. <laughs> I, don't want, I, don't want, I don't want a clarity in my role. I want an ish role. <laughs> yeah, you want an ish role. <laughs> totally. So wear many hats, right? So the thing I'm trying to think, the thing I try to think through is like, what are the things we need to be world-class at? You and I had a really good discussion about a great tweet that you sent me. And I've actually thought about it a lot, which is, 
in the Founders Podcast, Peter Thiel had this really great quote where he said he manages, he actually performance manages people based upon one thing, right? He said like, you have to be world-class at this one thing. My entire view of like how you do is, is gonna be perceived against how you do against this one thing. Jeff Bezos calls that single, single thread of leadership, mm -hmm. right? And we have something very similar in the way we do uh, initiatives across the software business, which we have a single owner for these kind of high priority initiatives, things fail or succeed with those people. Yeah. But coming back to like the original question, I do want to do like a two year look ahead in terms of what are the core pillars that we need to be yep. incredible yep. at, right? So yep. like there's, you actually had a really good slide back in uh, a deck that you did with at HubSpot that I always remember, which is like the three year vision for marketing. And you yep. had this slide where you had what's foundational and then the core three pillars on top. And I thought that is a simplistic way to say, these are the only things that matter. So I really want to get to the point where I'm like, at least over the next 24 months, these are kind of the things that truly matter in terms of where we want to invest. Then I wanted to still that into like a 12 month plan. My 12 month plan is going to be somewhat, I'll overgeneralize how simplistic I'm going to make this is, is the shit working? <laughs> invest more. Is the shit kind of doing okay? And can I make it better? I'll invest there. Is the shit not working? I'm just killing it. Now I'll yeah. tell you the part where I think we agree because we've talked about it before mm -hmm. where all of us in technology got really bad at when things were like doing incredibly well is we let projects fester for too long, right? Yes. Things that were just like, ah, you yeah, kind of look, oh, look at it. Six more months. It'll yeah. work out. Yeah, they rarely work out. Everybody it's not trash, PS just never works out, but it's not doing anything incredible. And you're like, should I give that? And the reason you do that, I think is because killing that project forces you to make hard decisions. Correct. It forces you to look at the people who are doing those things and say, well, can I realloc reallocate them? Do they have skills to go elsewhere? Like you actually are forced to make really hard decisions, but I'll stop there. But I, I'm just trying to think about what have I seen signal in that's working really well? And can I push that further? All mapped to the company strategy, like map to the yeah. core company goals, the priority things that we need to do next year. Um, look at the things that I think are doing kind of well, but not where they need to be. And how do I actually augment them to be in that category of like, oh, there's signal, this is really yeah. working. And then what have we tried to no fault of like execution or the team or anything like that? What have we tried that just hasn't done it, right? Has, yeah. it just, it we had is, hypothesis yeah, and the hypothesis wasn't not, correct, not right? That, unless like stop doing those things and try to reallocate that resources to either of the other two buckets. Yeah, okay. So I want to break down a couple things. First, you need to have clear company goals in terms of, hey, this is how much revenue we're trying to generate. The, these are the core plays at the company-wide level that we think are going to generate that revenue. And then whether you be marketing, sales, any function, you need, you need to build a plan to line up against that. And I wanna give you my cheat sheet for building a great plan. And my cheat sheet for building a great plan is, yes, you need a pillar-based strategy where you can't do 100 things. You need really three, four things top that are the core priorities. And then you have what I call some financial work, foundational work, like operations, demand generation, Creative. stuff that's just, yeah, that's just kind of run rate of, of how you work. But everybody's like, cool, it's a slide with a few boxes. Awesome, thanks for the, thanks for the knowledge. Oh, I can't be the slide <laughs> with a few boxes. Well, so, so but no, but it's, but is, <laughs> but I, I, well, the point it is like, how do you get there? Yeah. And the point how you get there is, I think there are a couple of things that are very important. The, at any time I make a strategy, I, I do, I have a couple of exercises. The first thing I do is, what are the first principles? What are the things that we right. believe to be true about our team, how we work, everything? And I try to lay those out. And I normally have between six and 10 of those. Cause then you're like, oh, this is what I believe is going, is true about how we work. Sometimes I will do a second version, um, which is basically like, what are the unfair advantages we have? Or sometimes it is, what are the things that we believe that nobody else believes yet? Right. Like we believe these things are gonna be true. Nobody else yet believes these things are gonna be true. So we're gonna make bets early and we're gonna reap the reward of these things being adopted and being popular ways of, of marketing or ways of consuming information in the future. We did a lot of this when we bought The Hustle, when we built out HubSpot Media, the podcast network, all of those things, we were very early to that because we had a belief that creators and media were gonna be how brands were gonna grow in the future. And we wanted to be an early adopter there. That's proved out to be a smart, a smart bet, working very well for us. But that's an example of once you have those principles, once you have those kind of unfair advantages, then you can actually look at them and say, oh, I'm gonna juxtapose, the, juxtapose those against the goals of the company 
And then I can actually figure out what are the, what's the groupings of work to actually get there. And then I can roll those groups of work under a couple of clear, simple buckets to focus on. Like one of my buckets is like influence and how do you build owned media and brand marketing to actually drive influence with your audience, right? And so that's a good example of, hey, we have these beliefs that like, creators, emotion, all of these things are going to be critical to buying things. That translates into this influencer pillar. That translates into a brand marketing plan and a media plan. And that's like a pretty good cascade of how that works in a very kind of succinct way. And so a strategy to me that's really successful is really simple. You know, it's a couple page document. It's it's a 10 slide deck. It's nothing crazy right? And part of strategy is in its simplicity. Where I actually think people screw up is in the simplicity of that strategy. But then I think they screw up in one thing that you're an expert at that we haven't even talked about that I want to talk to you about. So I hate process. Oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. And Kira knows- This is where AI is going to help you and I. Kira knows that I hate process and Kira also hates process. It's probably one of the things that makes us friends. Mm. So, Kieran, I had a long, deep, intimate conversation with ChatGPT about process, my hate of process. And it ended up in a very interesting place. And we had a lot of debate around process versus systems. Because I thought to myself, I was like, man, I really hate process. I hate rules. I hate doing stupid stuff. Like even checking you in today to get into the office, there was this process like, why does this process exist? This is a dumb thing. You want me to fill out this form? You like I just, I just get allergic to you it. You want to focus, but it, I still think, well, my thing is I am obsessed and it's a strength and a weakness. I don't want to make this mm-hmm. side to be a, a, an only a strength. <laughs> Every strength is a weakness, yeah, my friend. I'm obsessed with doing important things. <laughs> yes. And I feel like process to me always feels like I'm doing things that are not the important shit. And that's why I get allergic to a lot of it. Well, so this is so this is my new mantra that I'm sharing with you for the first time is we build systems, we don't build processes. And I had this long chat with Chat GPT around the difference you between doing systems with Chat GPT. I am work therapy. <laughs> Do work therapy. I'm picking out start, my work. Is it good? I might start. It's doing pretty that. good. God, yeah, I got some. I got some. Thera- I'm like <laughs> shit out of Chat GPT today. I got some therapy stuff going. I need to go. On, I need to go on the Chat GPT on then. <laughs> so I was having. I, I needed some process therapy because I'm allergic to process. And then I, I've, I've been reading and thinking more about systems. And what, this is what got me here is years ago. One of the smartest things we did is we had a strategy was like, hey, we think there's an opportunity for us to really grow organic search much better than we're doing now at HubSpot. And we we think we can 10x our organic search. And great, how we do this, we're going to follow this pillar and cluster model of content to rank our content and get more search traffic. And what was interesting about that is that pillar and cluster model that was not like, we weren't the only people doing it. Everybody in the world that was smart at SEO, like realized that was kind of the way to do it. What was brilliant about what we did was that we built an amazing system, not process. And here's here's how I think about the difference. Basically, we had this SEO team that could do keyword research, and they passed over this keyword research over to this content team who would then create content and basically package it up. And in that, you know, that content team, for example, it's like, the guardrails were like, hey, this is kind of what you're creating this content about, you're writing about. And here's some basic formatting technical things so that Google can read it, discover it, crawl it well. But it wasn't a process because a process would have been like, you must write a six-step blog article. You must use these examples, right? right? We had a system that said, hey, this is how this should work to achieve this result in a repeatable way so we have a shared understanding. Exactly. But within that, if you're the SEO analyst, it's like, I, can, I have individuality to make my own choices and how I think about the nuance of this keyword research. I can say this doesn't look right and I want to move this here. If I'm, a, if I'm a blog writer, I can say, oh, this is this topic's kind of boring. I'm going to reframe it this way. It's still going to work for this keyword. I'm going to find this other example. And that it was the magic in it. It wasn't this rigid process. It was a flexible system. It's the playbooks. It's, it's a playbook for success. And that is what I'm trying to get yeah. to for everybody watching today. It's like, if you have rigid processes, they will kill you. If you have systems that provide clarity and rigor to grind out things that you know are going to work, but still give humans the independence and flexibility to make the best judgments, that's where you're going to win. 
I, so that's my that's my hot take. This is this is the result of all my chat GPT therapy. Man, that's some good therapy. Actually. Do you, what, what, what's your take? I, so, give, I, so, give me, give so me your I, review. So I agree with this, right? Because I've always thought marketing is built on repeatable playbooks. I actually think one of the things you something in your example is incredibly important for people when they're building strategy. It's actually where most people go wrong, right? <laughs> the true. marketing leader comes in. They've been up all week working on this strategic doc that they have to present to the exec team. They have to present to the founder. They've been at it all weekend. Like they wanted to watch the fight in. They wanted to hang out with the friends. They couldn't do it. They had to present this. And by the marketing leader, he means Kieran because yeah. he's talking about watching fighting and being up <laughs> yeah. all weekend. No, this is something we. <laughs> and so they go in, they present this strategic doc. It's big vision for marketing. People think it's like super cool. They're like, ah, job done. And then they go off and they do their plans. And none of the things that they talked about actually are in the tactical things that they do, right? Yeah. The, the stretch strategic doc is so far removed from what they do that year, it doesn't cascade down, right? And they actually think just getting people to agree to the strategy is the is the hard part and the part that you actually need to achieve. You talked about there that you have an hypothesis and a, strate- a strategy, and that strategy results in a repeatable playbook that you actually integrate. integrate. I think most people miss that. That's is, the, that is the part everybody fails at. Strategy should be clear, concise, but actually pra- much more practical than I think a lot of marketing leaders do and actually just result in like, here are the repeatable playbooks that we're going to institutionalize for the next the next year. And that's why I think it's really important to say, as part of that, what signal have we seen in things that we want to do more of and what signal have we seen in terms of things we want to do less of. But I do agree the process that I, I like systems. I like repeatable playbooks. I like engines. And I like then people to be able to work within those things, right? Just like sports. Like I don't, you define a playbook and the people within there decide creatively how to execute on that playbook. Well, well, so I think the sports metaphor is a very interesting one because I would make one other. Except for Kirk Cousins. See, I know my stuff. Does he, he just like throws the ball exactly where you tell him to throw the ball. Kirk Cousins is a fascinating quarterback, but that's a, that's a whole other. Someday someday Kieran and I will host, we'll host a football show and it will all just be American football and soccer. It'll just be, just be us talking about soccer and American football be great but w- one of the things i want everybody to take away is that you need more systems versus process and the reason and, and you call the systems playbooks which i think is smart and you're like hey they have playbooks in football and, and other things and you know what happens in a playbook like if you're using american football a receiver is supposed to run a route but they have some leeway in how they right. run that route just like i was talking with that blog writer and my, what i will tell you let's see if you agree with me if you need a process you have the wrong people if you have, mm. if you need a process, you have the wrong people. If it needs to be so rigid that there is not that flexibility for people to make judgment calls, then you have the wrong people. Yeah, it's. It, I think process is the result of bad people who do not this. have the right skills for the role, and that systems are the ways that you focused really smart, ambitious people. You know that is a really great point. I actually have seen many examples of processes that are put in place to force people to do things that they should actually be doing. I've seen it in in companies where people are like, here's the processes that we have to make our managers good. And I'm like, the managers should just do that stuff. It's part of their job. Like You shouldn't have to institutionalize all of these kind of processes to make that manager do the things that they should do, right? So I agree with that. I think sometimes we use processes as a crutch because we're trying to force average people to be to do the things we need them to do. Yeah. Whereas actually what great teams can do is be given clear things that they should be accountable for, like a clear picture of what success looks like, some playbooks that we define together, and then they have the creativity to go and execute on that in the way that they think is best to execute on that. And so I think the, the kind of cas- cascading order of operations there the hypothesis and the first principles and the hypothesis is really good. Like we, yeah. that's actually part of the doc that I'm building is based upon like, what are the first principles? What is the unfair advantage that Zapier has that can actually help us to grow in the following year? And I know that that was a big part of how you built strategic docs. Then the next part is like coming back to this, to the Peter Thiel quote. I always, I actually went down a path of like, read that and I was like, ah, you know, Steph Curry is kind of an example of this, mm-hmm. right? He's not saying you don't need to be great at a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Steph Curry is great at a lot of things to do with basketball, yeah. but he is world class at like and changed the game because of his abilities and three pointers, right? Yeah. And I think that's what you're saying is like, okay, well that cascades into like we need to be good at a bunch of things, but where is it really important? Where for us are we to going to be the best in the where world? Where are we going at? to be the best in the world? And then the thing that I think gets disconnected is usually that's the job, right? oh, I feel good. I got people to agree to this. And then I go off and I do a bunch of crazy stuff the following year and it doesn't really 
resonate with the strategy that I pitched, that strategy should be close enough to the playbooks that it cascades into that. And then that those playbooks cascade into like quarterly goals where people are accountable to those goals, clear, actionable, can understand if they've been successful or not. Well, c- correct. And I think the point that we're making is to that the, to translate a strategy into action, you need playbooks slash systems, right? To right. do that and do that really well. And that if you need rigid process, I said you have the wrong people. It could also be true, I want to add, that you have the wrong leader, right? Right. It, could, it, it can also be true that you do not, the leader does not trust the team enough to give them the autonomy and flexibility and is trying to micromanage and be very prescribed. And that is not, uh, that's not successful. The other thing that you touched on in there that I want everybody to really take away is you said, hey, what are we going to be best in the world at? If you are going to plan for next year, you want the best team possible. And the best teams want to work on big aspirational problems and issues. And so if you're not willing to say, hey, we are going to be try to be world class at this thing, then you're not going to have world class people to work on that thing. You have nothing that people will want to yeah, aspire you, to People be. are not going to be aspirational. Right. And we talk a lot about you know building a strategy, connecting it to a revenue plan. That's all important. But part of the job of a leader is to inspire people on the mission that they're chasing after and help get the best out of that team that's working on it, right? Right, right. I think it gives someone, it gives, everyone wants to get better within their role. It gives them something aspirational, which is like, hey, we're gonna be world-class at this thing. Now there's a balance in act here. And I thought a lot about this. I'm curious to get your thought is, what if you're the team that's not in the world-class pillar, right? And so you have to also be a leader who's willing to say, it doesn't mean that others, and I know you struggle with this sometimes, it doesn't mean that all of your work is not important, but I have to make calls. And the call is over the next 12 months, these two things truly matter, well, truly matter. This is, this is the hardest thing of building a plan and why most leaders screw up building a plan. Because they peanut butter. Because they peanut butter, they want to make everybody feel equally important, equally special. Here's the truth. The truth is the type of work some people do is more important than some of the work other people do. At a given point in time. At a given point in time, yes. That, it's true. That might not always be true, but for normally a span of six to 12 months, based on the focus and the problems you're trying to fix in a business, that is always true. And most leaders, what they fail to do is say, hey, this is the most important work right. that we need to do. And that doesn't diminish the work that might be this next tier of priority down. It doesn't mean that it is also not important to grow the business to do those things, but you have to give the organization signal of like, you must focus on these things. Right. I would say... As a leader and as a company, a growing company, 90% of your pain comes from things that you have said yes to, not things you have said no to. Ooh, I love that. That is where most of all companies' pains come from because they do not ruthlessly prioritize and do not understand what are the only couple of things that we need to do over the next 12 months. And we're going into a period of, we're in a period of uncertainty. Next year probably is going to be the same. There's never been a more important time to understand what are the most important things that I can do next year to win. And I'm okay being average to or like good to average at these other things. And I think that is like some somewhat of a, I don't know if it's ego or just, <laughs> John, I don't want to like, and sometimes it's the founder because the founder's like, no, you have to be like great at all these things, right? They don't give the team the leeway yeah. to like not succeed at all well, these the, things. The point, the point of having a strategy is to focus. And so to kind of recap today's show, you want to have a clear strategy and that strategy is going to have, you know, three to four kind of components. You're going to get, you're going to determine those three to four components based on the priority of the business. And then your series of principles and advantages that are going to help you say, Hey, we, we can help the business in the best ways through these specific areas of focus. And then for those area of focus, you're going to build systems, not processes. Right that are playbooks that are repeatable that you can go and execute on that are going to map clearly back to that financial plan and financial results. And then if you have problems in those systems and playbooks, you're going to assess, is that a leadership problem? Is that a people execution problem? Or was our hypothesis wrong and we actually need to change the work? Those are kind of the three iteration loops you're going to do over the course of the year. Right. right? It's Exactly. Is it the wrong problem to work on? Is it the bad execution and do I have the wrong talent? And I think you need to ask yourself like, okay, maybe it's the right thing, but I just don't have the right team set up for success. Or maybe it's the right team, team set up for success. I just don't have the right team. Correct. All right. 
That is our quick crash course in planning for next year. Drop any comments with follow-up questions you have, examples of plans that you made, any other tips that you want to share on building a great strategy in 2024. It's been Marketing Against the Grain. We'll be back with you real soon. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history. Calls, support tickets, emails, and... Here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot. Grow better. 